All right, thank you for coming. Um, the whole presentation is effectively an introduction, so <laughs> you'll see. You'll see how that works. The, um, the first thing I wanted to say is um, chairs office hours on Fridays. I didn't see anybody last week, so I'm hoping to hoping to hear directly from the students because of, of all the various faculty. I think I really only know two people in this room <laughs> very well. <laughs> so, uh, in order to make that less of a less of an issue, I would like to, to, to see people and hear from you. Anyway, so um, this is essentially on my path both to and within the University of Michigan. I've been here almost thirty years. So, if I just got if you just got me two here, then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's missed. So. Um, I know it's just like the movie theater. Before you get to the main event, you always have to have the boring commercial. Um, I do run an undergraduate um, research team that's funded by the Navy, part of the Naval Engineering Education Center. Um, right now, the team's almost full. I think I got one, possibly two openings. Uh, the focus of the work is on uh, Navy sonar type stuff. It's meant to be a learn by doing experience. So if you show up, at the, if, you, if you're interested in the, in the in either work for pay or for a 490 credit, we can get either of those worked out. Anyway, the, the, the main thing is that it's supposed to be an, uh, an educational activity, which is utterly different than your classes. It's all supposed to be about learn by doing, as opposed to um, some of the things that you would get in an ordinary fashion. All right, and I'm especially looking for juniors and sophomores at this point. Because I think I've got four seniors on the team. The next May, I'm going to be I'm going to be toast because they're all going to graduate, and then then I'm going to need whole fresh crew. All right. So enough on enough on that. Anyway, get to me about the need if you're interested. So <laughs> my starting point. Okay, that's, that's I dug through the stuff my mom gave me, and I found that's a picture of me when I'm about one year old, and I was born in. Mesa, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. So the downtown Phoenix is like here. Okay. So Mesa is over here. My my father actually, my father, mother, and my older sister, we all lived in Tempe. And my dad was a faculty member at ASU, which is right about here. That's downtown in Tempe. But the hot but at the point, this place was all empty at that point 60 years ago. So the closest hospital was actually in Mesa. So that's where I was born. The, um, the interesting feature is that here I am in, I'm in chance coincidence. <clears throat> My future spouse was growing up over here in Glendale at exactly the same time. <laughs> okay, we, we met later in California. <clears throat> so, um, my father was, was a faculty member at ASU when I was two and a half. My dad was hired by the Aerospace Corporation. And at least as my mom tells the story, um, he was working in, uh, he was a physicist, he was working in an area of optics, which is becoming very, very important for satellite observations. He could never really tell me about the stuff that he was doing, but I know that when he got the offer from the Aerospace Corporation, my mom looked at it and she couldn't believe, she said, is that per month or per week? <laughs> okay, because it was so much more than he was making at ASU. So, so, so we moved to California. Um, anyway, so there's Phoenix, a little black dot, and then we moved to California. And the place we went to was a place called Palos Verdes. And all I can say is that if when you hear about people talk about this, this was an idyllic childhood, this was, this was the best place. <laughs> I think everybody likes the place where they grew up, but I really like the place they grew up. Anyway, we're right, we're right on the coast. This is a really nice place to live. So this, of course, is a from of course this from um, Google Google Maps. Here's the house that I grew up in. And of course, this is, the, this is the very eastern edge of the Pacific Ocean. Now, what you can't tell from here, this is about 200 feet up here, and then there's another 200 feet up. So by the time you get to my house, I had almost a 180 degree view of the ocean throughout the time that I was growing up, which was really nice. And there was a couple things that a couple things that made that really really pleasant. Okay. Uh, the first is that I'm approximately 30 miles south of downtown Los Angeles. So within an hour's drive in all directions, there's something like 25 million people. 
And we lived here at a time when cars didn't necessarily have catalytic converters. <laughs> and just so many people in such a small area, you did wind up with smog problems. However, when you're this close to the coast, one of the things that happens is the sun comes out in the morning. The ocean stays about the same temperature, but the land heats up. Okay, the air rises, it pulls in fresh air from the ocean. So for, so for most of my childhood, we had an onshore breeze nearly every day. So even though we're very close to downtown Los Angeles, it was essentially clear air almost all the time. And the other thing is that there's a wonderful part of the world. It's dry. I could bicycle like on, you know, 24-7, 365, wherever I wanted. So the, the uh, I didn't really learn even how to spell winter until I came here. <laughs> okay. I went to a high school where when it got down to 55, people put down coats on. <laughs> and when, when we finally moved here later on, I had still had some of my clothing from Southern California. And it, the, uh, you know, you wear a nice coat and it looks nice on the outside, but there was none of the snow cuffs. So the wind would go in this sleeve and out this sleeve and I was freezing <laughs> because the, the coat was for show because, you know, 55, it's actually not that cold. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so this is a, this was a wonderful place to live. Now, the, when I was there, these houses didn't exist. So I could essentially leave my house, walk down to the woods, then down Langley's, cross here, and just cross this open field. I could, if I left my house, I could be throwing rocks in the ocean in like 15 minutes. Which was which was just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. <clears throat> and the other thing that I really liked about it is that if you ever lived in a big city, everything's crowded. But I lived in a place where I always had a view that was half of it was uncrowded, and it was different every day. Okay, certainly at the uh, as you go to design and build stuff for the marine world ocean is different every day now many days it's not too bad but there's like some days it's like wow <laughs> you know Poseidon is angry today and there's other days it's like he's asleep <laughs> so anyways because of the because of the view there would be ships sailboats and whale watching were all possible from my backyard <laughs> so one of the things about pictures from my childhood um this is the family I grew up in my mother, my father, my older sister, younger sister, and younger brother, and that's me. And this is from 1976. So, with the colors and everything, and the hairstyles look dated. That's because they are. That's my high school diploma from 1978. And because I grew up near the water, I was a water sports enthusiast. <clears throat> and this is me on those cliffs. Essentially, this is now this is that 15 minute walk below my house. <clears throat> so after after having a ton of fun. <clears throat> to high school, it was then time to go off to college. So, <clears throat> the house is down here on the Cosbury Peninsula. Okay, downtown Los Angeles is here. Dodger Stadium is about there. Um, went to school in Pasadena at Caltech. It's a it's a city. It's famous once a year for the Rose Parade. Okay, and otherwise most people forget about it. Anyway, the, um, it's about a 40, 45 mile drive. Okay, when, when I did this drive, it was a single deck freeway. <laughs> they have since made it double deck and it, this traffic still is bad. <clears throat> the, the fact is it was, I was close enough to home, I could come home for visits when I wanted to. But I was far enough from home so that I didn't get unwanted visits from my parents, <laughs> which I thought was, it was actually, it was actually quite nice. I, if, I, if I shouted and screamed, they couldn't hear me. And if I misbehaved, they couldn't hear me either. <laughs> okay. But one thing I did, I did do is that I had been, I had been right here since I was looking at the ocean. Then I had a, now potentially an, uh, a mountain view that's right north of Caltech's Mount Wilson where all the radio frequency towers were, it's 5,000 feet. So at times in the winter time, even though this is Southern California, there'd be obvious snow on the mountains, which was, which was sort of fun to see. The problem is that <laughs> I'm here in the bad 70s and 80s, 
These are like the worst air quality days I've ever lived through in my whole life. You couldn't even see the mountains about approximately half a year. <laughs> okay? It was the kind of thing there'd be um, the California Boulevard, which is the, the main drag right south of campus. You could see the smog between the palm trees that were approximately every hundred yards apart. So it, it changed, it, it changed, it changed the whole way that you have to live your life, particularly if you want to exercise outside. You had midnight till 6 a.m. <laughs> and then the smog would start back up again and it didn't subside until midnight. <clears throat> so there was a so there was much less clean air. <clears throat> and but now I have a mountain view. So just some other things from college. Um, I went to Caltech, the um, eucalyptus trees, the mountains, if you could see them, would be back here, but it's a typical hazy day. <clears throat> I earned, I earned my first degree was a bachelor of science in applied physics. So I was not even an engineer at this point, but other important things happened in college. I met my, uh, well, future wife, okay, in, in 1981. Well, some more things. Everybody does other interesting stuff in college. I think you would have heard of them, but I was a founding member of Hojo and the Blowhards. Uh, his actual name was Howell Johnson, but the rest of us in the band couldn't handle that. We just called him Howard. <laughs> so he was Howard Johnson. So we were, we were Hojo and the Blowhards. And we actually, we, we played enough that we actually got paid a few times. So, so that was pretty fun. And of course, I had met my future wife, and she was also from Arizona, and her family did water skiing. So I had been surfing, and I don't know if any of you have done both. They're physically almost, I, you'd think there's a lot of overlap. There isn't, <laughs> okay? Getting the hold on to the rope, okay, all the twists and turns, it's all the other way. So, it, so that's probably the best picture of me that was ever taken because it, I was face planting behind the boat a lot, trying to figure this out. <laughs> Okay, so um, after regular undergraduate, then I went to grad school, and the first degree was a Master of Science in Aeronautics in 1983. <clears throat> but the other big thing that happened when I was in grad school, I was married in 1987, and that's Kathy. She was the one I had met, you know, essentially six years earlier. <clears throat> Uh, I then went to continue at grad school, earning a PhD in aeronautics in 1988. And this is a picture from my graduation day. And that's my mom, that's my dad, that's Kathy, and that's me. And I hadn't really started studying liquid stuff yet. This was uh, my thesis work was in turbulence, and it involved mixing in gas phase turbulent jets. Now it turns out at subsonic speeds, it's the same as if it was mixed in as it was uh, done in water. <clears throat> So now we've completed graduate school, and my wife, okay, had completed her medical school and her internship. So we moved from California. Oops, there's a little black, certain black. There we go. Okay, so we moved from essentially the Los Angeles area here. We, to accommodate her residency in anesthesiology, we moved north to Seattle. <clears throat> and this was in June of 1988. <clears throat> no. Okay, we're down here. I'm going anyway because I'm married. So we've got to hit a target up here. There was two targets that were potentially big enough to hit for the job search. One of them was Boeing, okay? Now, even at the time, Boeing was a huge company, but at that point, it didn't have as much defense contract work. It was about 85% commercial aircraft, and about 15% um, uh, military and government contracting stuff. I wound up in the 15%. <clears throat> uh, she was there doing that her residency in anesthesiology. <clears throat> so while I was up there, I looked at Boeing for about a year, realized it was not for me. <laughs> And then moved on to the applied physics lab at the University of Washington, which this audience probably has just heard quite a bit about. <laughs> or at least you probably saw some of their advertising commercials and stuff. Um, 
it's an interesting place. It's a gorgeous campus. And it's one of the few stadiums I've seen they have an overhang on the top to help keep you dry when it rains because it rains so much there. So it's, a, it's one of those football stadiums where it's two-sided, okay, with the sands, but then there's this great big, huge overhang. <laughs> anyway, so what did I do? At Boeing, I was a senior specialist engineer. When I'd gone north, I didn't know whether I wanted to go academia or industry, but this, this job presented itself when another one did not. So I tried it out. So, Anybody heard of the Strategic Defense Initiative? That's Star Wars, right? Yeah. Well, not the movies, the, the, the government plot or plan. This was bizarre. <laughs> this is, so I worked on a laser concept inside uh, Boeing Aerospace for the following. So CONUS, that's short for Continental United States, and USSR, this is now there's still the Russians over there, but this, this was our defunct conglomerate en enemy. The basic idea is that somewhere over here, you would have enormous, I mean, almost inconceivably large laser station. You would then send a laser beam up to a satellite in geosynchronous orbit. Okay, now this is not drawn to scale. The Earth is what about 4,000 miles in diameter. You got to send it up to like 22,000 miles. I mean, it's like the idea is that the Earth would be this big, and they would, anyway, so to a geosynchronous orbit reflected like 40,000 miles to another one of these, and then down on the Soviet Union. So you send the laser power up, over, and down, and you're somehow going to put enough heat on that booster so you can destroy it before it can, can come to our side. <laughs> now, the, this was so preposterous. Almost everything that needed to be done was at least several orders of magnitude away. Okay, if you've ever tried to just take a laser pointer and point at something in the far distance, you realize just holding it like this, now you probably got, it's, it's worse if you have too much coffee jiggles around. Okay. Even if you held it perfectly still, you have to send that laser through the atmosphere. And the atmosphere makes it jiggle around. <laughs> have to solve that problem. So pointing accuracy was a, was a huge problem, okay? The laser power and laser fluencies were a huge problem. And then, then there was just like, uh, what if we, or what if the, our opponent used the same paint on the outside of their boosters that we use on our mirrors? So that even if you can put the laser energy over there, it just reflects off. So shh, don't say that. <laughs> there was a point, there was a point in my career, I was, I was about ready to quit. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna quit. And the senior engineer pulled me aside and said, you missed the point of this. The whole thing with the Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative was, it was a political tool. Not that you would have remembered this, but the strategic arm limitation talks that it was at SALT 1 or SALT 2 had broken down. For whatever reason, the government, Ronald Reagan came up with this, got the Russians back to the bargaining table. And many, 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 uh, I think senators and representatives of both parties got to righteously thump their chest in the in the House of Representatives or on the Senate floor and say, I voted for Star Wars. We're sticking it to the Soviets. Okay. <laughs> so it, it was politically this huge win. Okay. Technologically, uh, what damage there. <laughs> Although there's one thing that we did get out of it. They did learn how to do adaptive optics. And this was this was all done in the 80s. The folks at NSF wanted to get a hold of that information. They were going to rediscover all this stuff so that the um, folks from NSF walked over to the folks at the Air Force and said, can you just declassify that stuff so that the astronomers can do this? <laughs> and they, the answer was yes. So, the, so we have adaptive optics for, tele, for uh, telescopes now. It allows us to take better pictures from the ground, even though you're looking through the atmosphere. Anyway, so that, was, so that, that lasted about 14 months. And then I was able to find a postdoctoral science position at the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington. At least at that time, it was affectionately called the U Dub. Okay. And nobody ever said Huskies, it was always the dogs. <laughs> so the, um, this was applied physics not for physicists, this was applied physics for oceanographers. So this is when I essentially got some back to water stuff and started doing things that were related to Navy sonar. And underwater sound. And then in 1991, because postdocs don't last forever. Okay, postdoc is a ton of fun. 
it doesn't last forever. So I started applying for faculty positions. And now I had a better chance because I had a better resume, more papers, etc. So we moved from Seattle, which is, of course, up here. And we're over here, of course, in Ann Arbor. And uh, interesting one of the interesting features is that <clears throat> Heading south. <laughs> but you're heading colder too in the winter. Okay. The cold day in uh, cold day in Seattle in the wintertime gets below freezing, but just barely. The worst, coldest day that we were there, I think it got down to 25. And they had everybody, everybody was running their, their, their faucets to keep the, keep the water moving so that the pipes wouldn't freeze. Okay. So but the interesting thing is if you follow this contour. You're actually north of the Upper Peninsula, so what we so you get you got um you got the extreme variation in the days, so that the in the winter time it's like the sun would just barely come up over the horizon, and then at, at four o'clock, boom, it's gone. <laughs> so anyway, so we we moved to moved to uh, University of Michigan in June of 1992. This is a couple of pictures of me. I started as assistant professor in mechanical engineering in 1992. I don't have a 1992 picture. But I, well, I probably have one, but I couldn't find it. So anyway, that's, that's me in 2003. And then this is me for about seven years ago. And of course, you can see what it looked like today. But <clears throat> now that same interim chair. And I didn't lose the interest in water sports. <laughs> so for any of you, it's a, or at least now the NCRB is open again in the morning. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, probably about quarter to seven. If you're getting in the pool, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't update you on everything. Okay. Um, so I, I may still maintain my interest in aquatic or liquid sports. So uh, wife and I have a family. So these are our seven children. This is about 12 years ago. That's what they looked like then. That's what they look like more recently. These are this is a picture from my oldest daughter's wedding from just slightly more than a year ago. So I have to tell you that because we've got some <clears throat> got some Wolverines among them. So Michael graduated in chemical engineering from the U of M in 2013. <clears throat> Karen went back to Caltech. She really, really, really wanted to get out of town. Not that my not that my wife and I are annoying parents, but she read so so she knew that if she went to our alma mater, we wouldn't say no. So she so she like uh, got a degree in electrical engineering in 2015. Uh, Ellen, <clears throat> Ellen went to Notre Dame and studied biochemistry. She's just recently completed med school. Paul also went to Notre Dame. Here's another one of these. I got to get away from these jokers. <laughs> Graduate in 2017. Okay. Tommy came back here. He uh, finished in civil engineering slightly more than two years ago. And, and my daughter, Susan, is here now, your age. <laughs> yeah, she's over in mechanical engineering. <laughs> and my youngest son, Matthew, he's a, he's a wannabe computer engineer. He's, he was back and forth between math and computer stuff, but he's, he's still in a senior. Anyway, he want, he really wants to come here. So anyway, this is this is my wife and I from just a couple of years ago. <laughs> and some other things that I worked on. Um, in 2009, uh, Elsevier contacted me and said, because I had used the prior versions of this book and pretty much said, do you want to take, you want to take it over? And the lead author had passed away. So um, these are the two editions of this textbook that I've worked on. This is a, either you could say the senior level or first year graduate level textbook. So you might not have seen it, but the grad students may have. You know, the, the, the first cover is definitely an aerospace one. <laughs> the second cover was a more of a, of a hydro one. <laughs> okay, which, you know, I mean, mm. If the next cover's got a ship in it, that would be fine. But if somebody's got to suggest a good picture, okay? Because because my current co-author wants to go back and do another aerospace one. So <laughs> anyway, so I, I thought 
So this is a lot of the stuff about me. I thought some of the things that I mentioned, some of the things that I worked on. This is just a uh, essentially sort of a summary slide from a project that, that went on for about a half a dozen years. The, um, the world's largest water tunnel is in Memphis, and it's owned and operated by the Navy. This is the William B. Morgan Large Cavitation Channel. So this is the diffusion leg, it goes, the float goes down here, the test section is back here. And these are people. So it's the, it's the, it's the size of a large wind tunnel, but it's a water tunnel. And they have all these really interesting things. The, the energy flux through the test section is about the same as the surface of the sun, et cetera. So <laughs> it's, it, um, anyway, it's a great place to do testing. We tested a great big two-dimensional hydrofoil. This, this way we didn't have to do Reynolds number scaling to get the ship sizes. This is, the same. this is not as big as you'd have on an aircraft carrier, but it's certainly the same as you'd have as a, a, for a destroyer or a submarine, okay? Cord-based Reynolds number, except this one's side to side in the test section. So it's, it's two-dimensional. If you've ever seen a real ship propeller up close, it's just enormous potato chip, okay? <laughs> the folks designing that, there's a lot of work in there, <laughs> okay? There's a lot of work in doing one of those well. <clears throat> because of course you have, you, have to carry the, you have to carry the loads that drive the ship as well at the same time, have some kind of efficiency and at least for the Navy, I always want it to be quiet too. Anyway, so, the, um, so this, is, this is the foil, we polished it. So you can see it's shiny in certain spots. You say, oh, but what's this flaw in the middle? Well, that's the reflection from the manhole cover. And this is the ladder you climb to get out. So that's just a reflection of that. So that we, we did have it nicely polished. Anyway, the kind of thing that we learned is that we studied two different trailing edges. The thicker edge is the one that allows for crash back. Do you know what crash back is? Okay. Aircraft wing, aircraft always goes forward. <laughs> Propeller, much of the same idea, lifting surface, for which there's relative flow that generates forces. Except the... Uh, there's typically enough power in the prime mover in a ship with, I want to go backwards, but we're going forward at, you know, 25 knots. Captain says, I want to go backwards. You can take the propeller and turn it the wrong way with the wrong inlet. <clears throat> if you got a thin trailing edge, you can bend it. Then you ruin the propeller for a number of reasons. So the Navy tended to have thickened trailing edges. That led to, Vortex shedding under certain circumstances. There's many things in the ocean. These are essentially these are essentially acoustic spectra. There's many things in the ocean that sound like a hiss, which is what this is. <laughs> There's very few things that sound like a trumpet. <laughs> so if you hear a trumpet, you know that's a man-made device. So it's a so this these peaks bad. Okay, this stuff it's okay. <laughs> anyway, so that that was one of the purposes there. We also did we also did some studies of a great big flat plate same same facility the uh, three big pieces had to be brought down on a flatbed truck this was all manufactured out near the airport one of the things you might not know is that even though you're a naval architect and there's places in the world that move a lot of metal like this you're also in Detroit all of the stuff that's done for the auto companies I guarantee you you need something built there's a shop around here that can do it. So we got, it was quite nice that we, we could drive to get this stuff made. We didn't have to go out of state or anything. Anyway, so the fact is that there's a set of scaling laws that go with turbulent boundary layers. The Navy wanted to find out, does this go all the way up? Essentially the huge project. And what we found out, the scaling that you get from lab flows, it works. You go up to higher routes, it works. <laughs> Everything okay. Um, the thing I worked on also with, with Steve Sessio is um, localizing cavitation. And this is a particular case where you got essentially a secondary vortex cavitates first before an original vortex. And cavitation onset, super important for the people driving submarines. You can go up to that edge, don't go past it because it, then you tell the world where you are. <laughs> Worked on some stuff that related to Navy acoustics who uh, worked with Ford and then also with the Department of Energy through the Kansas City plant to do some acoustic localization of leaks. And now we're getting near the end. 
Um, did some work for Toyota on Beyond Line of Sight acoustics. The sound can go around corners, okay? Light doesn't. So one of the one of the things that's a priority in Japan is um, vehicle pedestrian incidents. The idea is, can you somehow make that safer by getting the vehicle not to see but to listen around corners? And it turns it is possible, but it's unlikely because we needed signal to noise ratios that are essentially impossible probably to attain in an urban environment. You need a 60 dB where you might get 10 at best. <laughs> anyway, but, but you can you can localize junk around corners if you use sound. <laughs> um, another thing the Navy works on is that if you have an acoustic source and then you listen, and the signal you get is typically scrambled because of the multipath. And you don't know where stuff is. So you'd like to, is there a way to automatically unscramble the signal? Because if this is now a clean signature of your opponent, if you record this, okay, you might not, you might not, <clears throat> you might not be able to decipher who it is or where it is. But if you get that, and there's a reasonably high cross correlation. Now you can go in and do the cross correlations and you figure out who's where, is this a, is this that Liberian freighter? Which is always making the, the say the Seattle to Hong Kong run at this time of day, or is this somebody spoofing that and actually trying to do something else? So this was worthwhile. And then the one that I worked on most recently, this is the one I really like because this was this was considered to be an impossible problem. So just quickly, so this is the depth of the deep ocean. From essentially zero, this is the ocean surface down here to six kilometers. And then for acoustic tracking purposes, you'd like to go to as long a range as possible. This goes out to 300 kilometers. This is well over the horizon, okay? Even on a tall ship and you're essentially looking up way up on the bridge, this is well over the horizon, okay? You're trying to essentially use acoustic signals now to determine where stuff is, okay? To determine where your opponent is. And in this case, this is where the traditional in-band uh, acoustic localization we find the source back here, which is off by more than a factor of three in range. This is where the source actually is. And then the Dave Dowling, Dave Dorowski, super fancy dancy stuff. We get a different circumstance where this is where it is, and this is where we found it. So by essentially changing the signal processing from the higher frequencies down to lower frequencies, we got a little more ambiguity, but we far more robust result. <clears throat> and that's the sort of stuff I'm working on now. And we had the, the big hydrofoil, we had the big flat plate. We also now have the big six to one prolate spheroid, which is a stretched football. And you can imagine why the Navy wants to study one of those. And they're interested in high angle of attack flows at high Reynolds. Level. <laughs> so with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> yes. What instrument did you play in Hojo and the Blowhard? I was the electric bassist. <laughs> Other things. The floor is open. <laughs> Yes. Biggest wave you sir. <clears throat> okay, now to me it was it seemed big, but it's far far smaller than the um, than the things you can see on the internet now. One of my favorite one of my favorite Google searches I just type in giant ocean waves <laughs> and carriage turn and look at the stuff that comes up. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the, I had a picture of me surfing here. Okay, it was probably only about twice that size. It was. Oh, this was long before people used the um, this is a, the motorized craft to pull the surfers into the wave. It was all paddling. <laughs> and there's also there's also a point where um, you know energy goes with uh, G H. <laughs> so as the wave gets taller, it releases more energy when it breaks. There's a point at which you like, you know, it's just not fun anymore. <laughs> yes. So was your favorite 
project, probably that last one that you said was the impossible one? Or? It, it, that's, it's hard to say because as the times have changed, I've worked on different things. Um, when I was doing the hydrofoil, I love the hydrofoil. When I was doing the big flat plate, I love the big flat plate. <laughs> so now I'm, doing, now I'm doing this this stuff, this uh, Navy sonar long range source of localism. I love it. <laughs> so it's um, it, it, it's the current favorite. Now whether it was more favorite than a past favorite, I have a hard time saying. <laughs> Dave, yes. I can completely see why you love where you grew up in California, but what do you love about Ann Arbor? Ben, you want to you want do you want a comparison or no 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 no, no. Okay. The, the first thing first thing this is far more affordable. If I if I grab the house I own now and just plucked it up. And dropped it down in Southern California, it'd be like times five or times four in price. Okay, so on the University of Michigan salary, which I enjoy, I can actually live in a really nice place. <laughs> the other thing is, like, because I didn't grow up with seasons, I actually enjoy all four seasons. Okay, the um, everything you know, each one has sort of its advantages. You know, people say, "What's the advantage of winter? No bugs." <laughs> you can go outside; there's no bugs. I'm one, of, I'm one of those. If, if all my little buddies in the insect kingdom just disappeared, that, that would be okay. <laughs> so, so those are things. Like, and also, this is a fantastic place to work. I mean, I, I, in the in the modern world, many of you might have multiple jobs before you've even been out of out of school for ten years. Okay, I I, I stayed here because I liked it. <laughs> Okay, the university's treated me well. The, um, the the environment is good, and because it's a university community, it's like almost no matter how weird you are, there's a group of people that say, "Oh yeah, that's us." <laughs> so you can you know you can you can find your community, and um, and for the and at least for a lot of time that I've been here, I've always felt welcome. And I, at certain to a certain extent, hope to be able to do that for you now that I'm. Now I'm kind of not necessarily you personally, but I'm sort of running part of the show here now. So, <laughs> yeah, sir. Are you coming to the position of chair? Ah, okay. <laughs> that that was something that almost made the cut in the in the slide deck. <clears throat> the current dean, Alec Gallimore, and I were hired the same year. So that not that you would know it, but I presume that when you came as a freshman, there were freshman orientation events. Okay. When I came as a faculty member, there's also faculty orientation events. And Alec and I would always wind up sitting next to each other. So we, we, we've been trading stories and teasing each other for years. <laughs> okay, so, so when, the, when this department needed a chair, he asked me if I would apply. And I said, look, I'm really happy in mechanical. You know, I, I don't, but, he's, but <clears throat> the, uh, the request came back and I said, look, I'll do it because you asked me. So I really, I really like Alec. I really trust Alec. So I'm, I'm, Alec asked me to do this job. I'm doing this job. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> what classes do you teach? <clears throat> I'm still 50% time in mechanical engineering. So I teach fluid mechanics, acoustics, and the junior level undergrad, undergraduate uh, laboratory class are the primary courses that I teach. So, so <clears throat> undergraduate, graduate level acoustics, undergraduate, graduate level fluid mechanics, and then the lab class. <clears throat> yes. When were your uh, available hours again? Fridays, 9.30 to 11.30. Now, those are picked based on what's the opening in my calendar. For all I know, you're all packed into classes at those times. I'm sorry, but that's what I had. <laughs> but I do hope to see you if you can come by. Yeah. Anybody else? No more questions? All right. Thank you very much.